<clears throat> okay, um, so I turned this thing on and it says here that there's a problem with the microphone. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. All right, I don't know what that was all about. Anyway, so it's been a while since I did this online. Um, it, you know, during the COVID, we had to do it like this all the time. So uh, I do have all this, uh, everything set up here. And um, so what's going to happen here is that we're going to go over the rest of this number one, chapter four, problem set number one. There's only one question left, as it turns out. And then we're going to do the second problem set. Now, um, one of the few good things about having this online is that I can, um, when I write the solutions on the uh, screen here, I can save a copy of them all and post them on Moodle. And the recording itself is also going to be available on, uh, not on Moodle. Moodle actually uh, doesn't have enough room for that, but I can save the recording for today and post it on my own YouTube account, which is what I did during the COVID. Um, I started out by putting everything on the, um, I tried to put it on Moodle, and then after a while, it became clear that for whatever reason, it doesn't have enough storage capacity for that. And I asked them about it, and they said, um, well, you know what, put it on your YouTube account, because uh, I guess that's one of the drawbacks um, of M Moodle is that it just, for whatever reason, doesn't have the capability of storing a bunch of videos. Now, this I'm hoping this will be the only one of the semester. Because if not, that means that I've gotten sick again. But, um, you know, it's sometimes, especially as we get towards the end of the semester, the weather can get really ugly, too. And in fact, I seem to remember last fall, there were two separate occasions when we had to do this online because of flooding. So you never know. You do not ever know uh, what's going to happen with, uh, with life, I guess, in general. So um, what we're going to do then is I will show you where my YouTube account is. And by the way, this this one might take a while because the um, the video has to be converted into the proper YouTube format. And um, I have no idea how that works, but eventually it will be finished and I can post it. So I think all you have to know, uh, people told me in the past that they literally just searched for my name and that was good enough. Okay, so... Um, Oh, you know what I just realized? I never turned on the screen sharing, so you can't see what I'm doing. And, uh, oh, there's already a couple of chats. We have yeses. Okay. Um, okay. I guess that means everything is okay. Um, good. So anyways, I started to say, so this is my account. And if you go in here to my channel, it's called, I guess. So what I used to do, and I'll do it again this semester, is create what's called a playlist where only the videos for that class will be stored. So if you come back here and look at it, you'll see there's a bunch of them left over from past semesters. I never deleted them because, well, I guess I got plenty of room. Um, I don't know how much room. One person's sound on. I'm allowed. Oh, is somebody's sound annoying everybody? I can't see. Uh oh. Uh oh. Looks like they're all off. All right. Well, anyway, so I don't know how much storage I actually have on YouTube. I don't know if any of you know more about it uh, than I do, but um, I had in the past when we we're um, during the COVID, of course, all of the classes were online. So I accumulated quite a big list of uh, videos here. And um, so what I will need to do is create a, a playlist for this particular class after uh, the video is ready, and then you'll be able to find it here if you want to look at it again. <clears throat> but if you feel like it, I mean, you can see there's all these other ones floating around. If you want to look at, look at some of these, um, they're all public. Um, I can't see any reason to hide them. <laughs> what, do we, what do I care if somebody reads my pre-calculus or, um, you know, uh, stats notes or whatever. So that's where they'll be located. Anyway, so, you know, watching the video is completely optional. It's really for just in case you miss something or in case, um, you, you know, you couldn't be here. And um, 
So, but the uh, solutions that we'll work on today, I'll make them available as soon as we're done. Okay, so you might recall that we are just about um, any question left with the um, first problem set for chapter four. So let's knock that off and then we can get to the second one. Now, if we finish all that, maybe we can take a peek at chapter five, which is our introduction to trigonometry. Yeah, it's it's kind of a quickie overview of trig functions, which you'll need again if you're going to end up taking Calc 1. But um, it's good review. You know, it's like one of those things where you don't see it very often unless you're working in areas like, you know, engineering. But it's, you know, it's good knowledge to have. So I'm looking at my notes. It looks like we never quite got around to starting Chapter 5. So, all right, well, we'll see how that goes. All right, anyway. <coughs> All right, so let's get this one open. And it was just that very last one, um, one of the growth questions. So a car was valued at $38,000 in 2007. By 2013, the value had dropped to $11,000 due to depreciation. What will it be worth in 2017? All right, so what do we need to know? All right, well, this is a growth question, just like um, the others we saw, except think of it as negative growth. I mean, it's actually technically called depreciation. The car's value declines over time because you, you, know, you put more mileage on it and the value drops. So whenever we're do, dealing with these time-related problems, We've been using the notation n of t for number at time t. And uh, by the way, I have this cool uh, tablet here I can use to write on the screen. So that is very helpful for online teaching, let me tell you. So what do we know? Well, first of all, let's think of 2007 as year zero. And in that year, the car's value Actually, I'm running out of space here already. Hold on. It's a little, I have to plan a little differently with a document like this rather than on the whiteboard. If we think of 2007 as year zero, N of zero is $38,000. Now, remember, N of zero is what we mean by A. The A here is the initial value, okay? <clears throat> what else do we know? In 2013, which is year six, the car is worth $11,000. So we're going to make a prediction about 2017, which would be year 10. So we're solving for N of 10 because 2017 would be considered year 10. Right. So what can we do first? Well, um, since we have N of T, let's go back and do this again. Really, what we want to do is solve for B. OK, so we've already been told that A is 38,000. And since we already also know that N of six is 11,000, that equals 38,000 times B to the T power. So now all we have to do is some algebra, right? Um, 11,000 over 38,000 equals B to the T power. I'm oh, sorry, b to the six power. I should have substituted six here. Oh, see how easy that is? With that little erase button. <laughs> um, all right, so that means that whatever that ratio is, is b to the six power. So what we're gonna do is calculate the ratio, of course, and then raise both sides to the one six power. So this is um, point, 
Oh, actually, let's do that first. 11,000. 38,000. So what we basically did here was this. If you raise both sides to the one sixth power, B to the sixth power all raised to the one sixth power is just B. Okay, so that's where this is coming from. Okay, so you do whatever it takes to get B by itself. And that turns out to be approximately 0 0.8133. Remember, B is one plus the growth rate. And um, therefore, uh, we can solve for the growth rate as B minus one. And now we can take that point eighty one thirty three and that means it's minus point one eight sixty seven. So there's the depreciation is eighteen point sixty seven percent per year. <clears throat> now keep in mind, our job is to figure out what the car will be worth in year um, 10. So we know A and we know B. So remember A turned out to be 38,000. And B, as we just saw, is 0 0.8133. And you know, I was concerned when I sent out this memo, um, or this announcement, I was concerned that you wouldn't see it. But since you're pretty much all here, I guess it comes right into your inbox, doesn't it? When you get an announcement, like a regular email? Yeah. Okay, then, good. I, I wasn't sure. You know what I was like? Oh, no, they're not going to find out in time, and I'll be here all by myself. But my other class at 8.30, they all found, they all got the message. Oh, that's good. Okay. So if this, like I was saying, if you came in late, um, I, I'm sure that I'll be fine by Thursday. But um, once in a while, especially as we grind it down towards December, although usually it's worse in the spring, you never know when the weather might be so horrific that uh, it might be necessary to do this again. That area around that school, there's so many trees that there have been several incidents in the past few years where yeah, trees so fall down and there was there was no electricity or it was impossible to get onto the school. So um, so this worked out rather well. So if um, there is something really awful going on, um, I'll just you know do the same thing. I'll send you an announcement and then uh, we'll do it like this. We don't ever have to actually cancel the class, do we? No, <laughs> no that's ancient times either had to be there in person or not at all. Now we have another option, right? Okay, so anyway, last step is to calculate N of 10. <clears throat> okay. And you can see why the number is shrinking. You're raising, an, anytime you take a number less than one and raise it to some power, you're gonna wind up with a smaller number. So whatever this number is, it's gotta be less than 38,000. And in fact, it turns out to be, if you round it to dollars and cents, it's about 4811.62, let's say. Depending on, on how much you rounded this part. Um, that that's, you know, it can't be helped. You're, there's bound to be some rounding, but that's, that's fine. Okay. All right. So um, this one is done. Now I'm going to save this document that we had just created and I'm going to actually send it out uh, to Moodle, both as a word document, but also as a PDF, because if you're using a Mac, um, sometimes what can happen is the document that was created on a PC 
if you've got all this handwriting in here or equations, or if you've got symbols or whatever, it can look very strange on a Mac. So if that happens, you can look at the PDF version and the PDF version, of course, is simply a picture of what I'm doing. So either way, you'll be able to read what I've done. Okay. So I'll tell you what, let me save it right now. Watch this. Oh, that was so easy. <laughs> it, it might take a minute though, because it's a huge document. And then we can move on to part two, which is all about logs and exponentials, okay? Well, actually it's all about logs, now that I mentioned it. Um, okay, oh, we have a chat. Oh, so that's all right. Um, it happens, it happens a lot. Um, what we did was the last problem in the chapter for this one right here, you're staring at it. The practice problem number one, we had one more to do. We did it right now. Um, we have a car valued at $38,000. The value in 2013 had fallen to 11,000. We wanna know what it will be worth in 2017. So in other words, you think of 2010 as today, this is year 10. So we solve for the A, which is the initial value of the car. <clears throat> and then by finding out that the car will be worth $11,000 in six years, we were able to determine the value of B. And then algebraically, we solve for um, N of 10. So if you missed all that, you can. this will be posted on... Um, no, no, with, with, with a Zoom like this, especially since it was called at the last minute, um, what I can do is when we're done, um, the, the recording actually keeps track of who's logged in. So um, so you're fine. As long as you're physically here right now, um, it'll record that you're here. Okay. <clears throat> All right, then. So anyway, so now we're going to move on to the second um part two of the cha chapter four practice problems. And let's get this out of here. And now we're, oh, look at these. Now, these are all logarithmic problems. And, you know, logs have a lot of very helpful properties that could really save us some time and make it easier to solve other types of equations. So basically with these, we just want to understand more clearly what each one actually means. In other words, logs can be rewritten as exponentials. So in other words, the log to base four of Q equals M is equivalent to say four to the M power equals Q. Now, because they're letters, this is not going to help us very much, but it's important to understand how this works. Okay, the two of them imply the same thing. They're both equivalent ways of expressing the same information. But the log is basically doing the same. What is the exponent in this equation? <clears throat> That's really all that it's doing. Okay. Now, that being the case, they're all exactly the same. For example, B log base A b equals c implies this this little arrow was often used in math to, as a shorthand for implies okay that a to the c power equals b okay So it's a little abstract here. Um, maybe I'll, I'll tell it, I'll make up a real example in a minute. Log base 16 of y equals x is equivalent to saying that 16 to the x power equals y. Okay. Let me just do one thing. And then D, um, log X of 64 
equals y is the same thing as saying x to the y power is 64. <clears throat> so um, now let me just give you a quick example with actual numbers. Um, let's say we have log base two of 64 equals six. So with real numbers, it might be easier to see what's going on here. Now the base depends on what we're actually doing, what kind of application we're working on in real life, in, in practice. Okay, that sounds fine. Um, most of the time you're gonna end up seeing log base 10 and log base E, which is our natural log. Okay, log two, eh, you might see that too. It depends on what you're doing, but um, I think I mentioned this once before, you may run across these in science, um, like the Richter scale is actually a logarithmic scale, which means the numbers that you're hearing like five and six are actually exponents, like 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth. It's just that it's easier for people to think about whole, uh, integers. Or the pH scale you learned about in high school biology, those are also uh, logs. Three is like an acid, eight is a base, you know, those are actually uh, exponents. All right. So now we're just gonna work this backwards. Okay. Yes, we're gonna go the op opposite direction. So A, for example, um, <laughs> see, this is awkward, look at this. Um, there's a huge gap here. So my goal is to make sure you can see everything. All right, let's try this. So in part A, what of the X equals Y implies that the log of uh, four, base four of Y equals X. Remember, because this is just the exponent <coughs> of the expression. <coughs> Now for B, it's 10 to the A equals B. So always remember what's on the right hand side is your exponent. Okay. All right, well, if that's the case, part C Now here we have a tricky one. Now here we have a tricky one. Because this one is actually the same as what well, we've seen this before, natural log. All right, so remember log base C is often written as LN, which stands for natural log. I don't know who chose that name, but it's used so frequently um, in applications that uh, it came to be known as the natural log. They seem to be insinuating that this is the most useful one, <coughs> which I don't know. Again, it depends on the application. Like you might not see that in, in high school chemistry class, but you'll see it all the time in let's say finance or economics. Okay, one more log. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong one. Um, 19 to the X. Equals Y implies that 
log 19 of y Let me just make that a little neater. Of y equals x. All right. So these are just definitions. Now we're going to actually solve and calculate some numbers. We're going to get actual numerical values here. Um, all right, so like starting with the first one, just keep in mind that log three of X, as we've seen already, is equivalent to saying that three squared equals X. And that just simply tells me that nine is X. All right. So they wanna know what value, uh, what they're really trying to, what we're trying to find is that three squared is equal to nine um, for B. This is one eighth. Okay. So if you write it, if you know, remember the definition, um, the rest just falls right into place. All right, now C, <clears throat> log base five of X equals two. Okay, so again, if you rewrite it as an exponential, as opposed to a log, um, then it should be very straightforward. <clears throat> All right, and then one more. And then we can move on to the properties. Log base three of X, equals three is the same thing as saying three to the third is X or just 27 is X. All right. Now, these are very straightforward because you're just using the properties that we uh, saw. Specifically, let's just quickly review them. The log of any base of x, y is the um, sum. The log of a ratio is the difference. And then the log of x to the n power is just n log x.
They're all based on this, okay? Those three. In fact, here, if you notice, I just realized I didn't even put in a base because we don't need them. The only difference here is the LN um, because they're, uh, they're both the same base. So that means this first one can be rewritten as log 2x to the fourth times 3x to the fifth, which means log 6x to the ninth. Or you, if you want, you can rewrite that now as 9 log. 6x. So we've used two properties in this case. <clears throat> now, the one thing I do want to mention, though, um, it's understood that you cannot do this unless both logs have the same base. So by writing just the word log without a base, you're assuming that they're both the same log, whether it's two or eight or 10, it doesn't really matter. As long as it's the same, if they're not the same, then this doesn't work. Then we do something different. Now here with the B, we have natural logs. And so here again, because it's a difference, we can rewrite that as a ratio Oh, we have a chat. Um, you know what? I don't think that in this case, there is a standard. It's not the case, for example, that you always try to avoid having an exponent in here. In this case, I would say that both of these are defined to be equally simple or considered to be equally simple. So in other words, um, these are both fine. It's not like you're dividing by a square root or something. I would say in this case, there doesn't seem to be a convention uh, here. So you could really basically leave it either way. At least I've never heard of one. Yeah, that's true. No, e even then we want the radicals to be as simple as we can and try not to have them in the denominator. That's, that's always true. We try to avoid having radicals in the denominator, but in many other cases, um, there doesn't seem to be any particular convention, like uh, a preference between log 2x7 or 7 log 2x, unless it helps you um, get a, a, an, an exam, sorry, a, a result a little easier. <clears throat> now see, ooh, now they got a little trickier. 2 log x plus 3 log x plus one. Now for something like this, you probably would be better off rewriting them as log x squared plus log x plus one cubed so that you can now write it as a product. And then, um, uh, let's see. Well, ooh, um, actually, no, you know what? Yeah, no, all right, so here's what we're gonna do. So this one's a little bit convoluted. Um, You know, this probably wasn't, after all, um, the best. No, sir, we're making a mess out of it now. Hold on a second. You know what? All right, I'll tell you what. This is, this is not the best way to go. Let's stop right now.
it turns out that you can just write this as um, Yeah, the, I think that's the quickest way to go. Um, we, sh we don't need to fool around with it. Um, and then when you multiply these out, you'll have x squared plus x. And I think that's that's fine. <coughs> All right, and then for D, Ooh, look at this one. Now they're all the same base. So what you can do is rewrite these. Um, yeah, let's, let's do it like this. Um, Again, it's, it's not absolutely necessary. When we're done, um, we'll have X. Now there's a sum in here. And then there's a ratio because it's a difference. So you could leave it like this. In fact, you probably should, but yeah, let's leave it like this. I think this is the quickest way to do it. All right, now for these, when you have X in the exponent like that, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to need to use logs to solve for it. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Now, what I'm gonna do here is apply the a rule that we had. I'm going to take, because the base is nine here, log nine to the nine x uh, of nine to the x power is just x. Okay, this is a, a key detail. So that means that the log of nine both sides which i'm certainly allowed to do that'll speed things up quite a bit in other words think of log nine and nine raised to some power as inverses of each other sebastian so, mute yourself oh yeah we can i can do that Oops, okay, we're good. Yeah, because only because it causes feedback. Even if you don't have loud music in the background, it can cause feedback. But, um, oh, over the years of doing this online, there have been a lot of interesting um, accidents, shall we say. Um, people would say things that they didn't realize we were all hearing, and um, it could be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, there were a few cases where I'm sure they were regretted it. And what would sometimes happen too? That's all right. It happens. It's fine. Um, what would happen occasionally is like, imagine you're sitting there with your laptop and you're at home. Now, because it was the COVID, everyone was actually in their own homes. They weren't in their dorms. They were in home. 
And so what would happen occasionally is a cat would jump in front of the computer, you know, this camera, or little brothers and sisters would come in the room and things like that would happen. You know, it was a common, not a common thing, but every so often cats in particular, they like to jump up in the keyboard. And then of course they get in the way of you and the camera. And so I'm seeing this enormous blob of fur walking by and it's a cat, you know, because they don't like to be ignored as you know, and they don't have any idea what you're doing. So like, Oh, I'll just jump up there and see what's going on. So, um, there's actually um, several years ago, there was a video on YouTube that went viral, I guess, where somebody who's a professor in Canada somewhere was on, he's being interviewed on one of the major channels like CNN from his home office because it was the, the COVID, of course. And so he's sitting there talking about some deadly serious topic and all of a sudden the door bursts open and this little kid comes running in rah, and then the mother comes running in chasing him and then their animals come in and pretty soon it was just absolute chaos and this is all going on on live tv while he's trying to talk about some incredibly serious subject or other and it was just kind of funny um <laughs> because it's just it was just one of the things that you have to put up with during the covid um anyway so what's going to happen here is that on the left hand side we're just going to be left with x minus 10. now the right hand side Um, well, no, no, the right-hand side is going to be zero. Um, because the log of any base of one is just zero. Um, let's say it's log B. Because B to the zero equals one. Okay, so the right-hand side is just zero. And that makes things so much easier. Now, suppose you get to the end and you say, you know what, I don't know. I'm not so sure I've done this correctly. Let's double check. Oh, it did work. How do you like that? So in other words, when you have, just in general, if you've got something like this, um, b to the x equals some constant or other, then um, if you take the log to base b of both sides, then you end up with x equals the log to base b of just k. Because think of the log to base b and the b raised to the exponent as inverse operations so that you wind up with x or inverses of each other. <clears throat> and that's exactly what we did here. So in other words, because it was nine raised to some exponent equals a constant, we took the base, the log to base nine, so that on the left-hand side, we're just left with the exponent, okay? The right-hand side, this is just some constant. Whatever it is, that's, you know, we don't have to worry about that one. It's a constant. So number, um, now, oh, this one is E. Okay, now because it's E, that means you know that natural logs are going to get involved somehow. Okay. And in fact, our strategy will be to do this. Log to, um, oh, actually in a case like this, what you typically try to do is to simplify it as much as you can. In other words, let's not leave it like this. Why don't we divide out both sides by two? And then we'll apply the logs. Now remember, log, natural log, is just log base E. So 
So if that's the case, then that means what I have on the left-hand side is just 6x is log 13 over 2, which means that when we're done, we can just divide both sides by 6. And we're done. All right, does everyone see what we did? Oh, I, I didn't see my chats. Yes and yes, good, good, good. Okay. <clears throat> now, during the summers and the Christmas break, we do have classes that are entirely online. Um, for example, this coming Christmas time, we're offering statistics. And um, the good thing about it is that you're done with it in the month. The bad thing is that you're, you are you got to do a lot of work every day. So, um, and then during the summer, it's pretty much the same thing. So typically the Christmas classes and the um, summer classes are often done online. I don't know if any of you has taken one. Uh, I don't know. It takes a lot of self-discipline to do something like this online, especially during an accelerated time frame. But it's there if you want it. You know, if you want to knock off three quick credits, it's something that, to think about. Oh, I see a bear is in the class today. <laughs> I guess he's interested in math. <laughs> Hello, Bear. <laughs> yep, it's not exactly the same as a cat. The bear will sit there and, and not get in the way. <laughs> the cat won't be so patient. <laughs> All right. Now, of course, anybody who watches this video is going to see the bear, too. <laughs> so that's okay. All right, what was next? Now, C. Let's see. Ooh, this one's pretty sloppy. So again, let's just clean it up a bit. <coughs> we'll start by adding eight to both sides. Wow, this is a mess. And now I'll divide out the negative five. And of course, the negatives will cancel each other out. Now I'll take the natural log of both sides. And that's just some number. Um, and now, of course, the natural log and the e to the x essentially cancel each other out. And uh, now, of course, we'll just do some basic algebra. Oops. <laughs> well, add the eight to both sides. Uh, oops, sorry, no, no, add plus eight. <coughs> and then we'll divide out the nine from both sides. Okay.
let's see, do we miss any? Um, there was C. Got it so far back. D. Yeah, this is this is something that takes some getting used to. All the scrolling around uh, with an online class like this. Oh, I mean, it's so similar. We're just going to do a little algebra. Subtract the two, divide out by the 10. Um, I'll just simplify that a little. And now I'll just take the log of both, natural log of both sides. And then, um, so of course, I'll subtract the three. And then I'll finally divide out by the eight. Okay. All right, and then I think there's just one more, um, E. And it looks like it's exactly the same type of problem, I mean. All right, well, that's good. It's good practice. Okay, so we'll add the seven to both sides. Divide out the four. Take the natural log. <clears throat> and then we'll have um, three X plus three, log 15. Subtract the three, divide by three. Yeah, and then we're good. Oh, here we have a chat. Um, well, it, there's not, it's, it's some constant or other. I mean, it's probably just as easy to leave it like this. I don't know the exact value of log 15, but um, if we need, let's say this is meant to be um, a price or something like that, certainly we can figure it out. Um, let's see. Ooh, well, it's going to be a negative number, it looks like. This is equal to approximately negative 0 0.097. Okay, so we need that. That's fine. Otherwise, we'll just leave it like this. Okay, I think that was all of that one. Okay, yes, number six. <clears throat> So we're basically just going to use these same properties 
um, as you know, you should probably simplify first whenever possible. We'll divide out to five. Now, this is one of those cases where we have, because of the way the log is defined, this is the same thing as saying that seven squared is X. And that just means that 49 equals X. Okay. By the way, um, if you wanted to confirm this, um, the problem is your calculator doesn't have any other logs except 10 and E, but there's a way to get around that. If you were dying to know the log of 49, what you could do is take the natural log of 49 divided by the natural log of seven. <clears throat> so let's do that. Just, this is our double check because your calculator doesn't have log seven. It does have natural log though. So that would be approximately 3.89182. And then the log of seven. is approximately 1.94. Um, 5.9, well, you can see where this is going. Except for rounding, this should be two. Oh uh, yeah, almost exactly two. So this is this is our double check. Okay, so by plugging in 49 for X, we come up with two. And we remind ourselves of, of a very important property, which could help us if you wanna double check with these other logs besides log 10 and log E. Always remember that, it's a very helpful property. All right, B. <clears throat> we'll divide out. The negative eight. Now remember, this is the same thing as saying nine to the minus two is X. Okay. Or one over nine squared is X, which is the same as one over 81. Okay. Okay, what else do we have? C. All right, we'll start with some algebra. Subtract four from both sides. And again, because this is a log, this implies that two to the minus two is nine X. <clears throat> one over four, nine X. So what I'm gonna do, um, is divide both sides by nine.
All right. <clears throat> All right, I think there's another one, D. Let's see, yeah, there should be a D. Okay, here we are. Okay, so we'll do a little algebra, of course. Subtract the six from both sides. Divide by two. And now again, because it's a log, this implies that two squared is eight X plus four. Um, four is eight X plus four. Oops. And then that just means, of course, that X is zero. <clears throat> All right, so now I think, wow, is that it? Seven, and then we're done. Well, 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 I guess we're going to have a little bit of um, trig today. <laughs> Not necessarily your favorite subject in the world, but, you know, let's face it, we could use the review. <clears throat> All right, now remember how these work. They, in the book, they call this the one-to-one -one property. You have something like this log B of S equals log B of T. This implies that S equals T. So what that means here is that since we seem to have the same base, at least in the first two, this implies that 10 minus 3x equals minus 4x. So I'll add 3x to both sides. And that's it, I'm done. Well, that was easy. <laughs> that's the key to the whole thing though. Now, by the way, here's the justification for this. You don't have to do this, but I just want you to see that what we've actually done is this. And now that's why this is going to work. That's what you're actually doing with this rule. You're, you're using the correct uh, exponential on both sides. All right, now for B. Well, let's copy this. <clears throat> It's the same thing. You you just end up with um, negative three x equals 
x squared minus 6x. Uh, I'll add 6x to both sides. And I'll divide out both sides by x. Oh, there we go. All right, two more. <clears throat> C, oh, here's a chat. No, it does apply to all logs. Any base is fine, as long as it's the same base, okay? In other words, um, if this had been log three on the left and log three on the right, we would have been fine. Okay, as long as it's the same. Okay, C. Now, this is more about the definition of logs. This tells us that two to the third power is seven X plus six. Okay, this is the property of logs. Eight is seven X plus six, two is seven X. Oh, we like these, two over seven. There we go. And you can always double check. And just keep in mind that this is true because so it's correct. <clears throat> well, all right then, one more. And then we can take a very brief uh, stroll down memory lane. We're gonna go visit the garden of trigonometry, let's say, um, where all the flowers have a very strange look to them. Okay. Um, All right, one more and then we're done. So now this one is an example where I was just saying log four is on both sides. Therefore, by the one-to-one -one property, six X equals three X, uh, sorry, six minus six. Add X to both sides. And we just end up very simply with three halves equals X. Okay. So we are now masters of logarithms. So I'll be saving this and posting it on Moodle. Let me just quickly save it as a PDF. I'll put both of them there, just to guarantee you can read one of them. And then we can go grab chapter five, at least take a peek at it. Just refresh our memories a little bit about the basic trig functions. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a while. Yes, there they are, the trig functions. Now, you might remember, um, somewhere along the way, you may have been introduced to a mnemonic device to help you remember how they're defined. So let's just quickly review this. Let me just do one thing here.
Okay. Um, so this is what I was referring to. I'm going to write this bizarre thing down. And you might say, oh, I know what that means. So let's draw a right triangle. This is angle theta. <clears throat> the side opposite it is actually called the opposite. The one just to the side is the adjacent angle. And this is the hypotenuse. Okay. So this mnemonic is telling me that the sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse. The cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And then finally, the tangent of theta is the opposite over the adjacent. So this is how the numbers are actually calculated. Once you have the setup, you'd be given the size, the, you'd, you'd have to know the size of O, A, and H, of course. <coughs> but once you do, then you can easily calculate the sine, the cosine, and the tangent because of, this is how they're defined. Sometimes mnemonic devices work very well. Sometimes they don't. This one tends to stick in your memory. I think it's, it was a good choice. And yeah, and also this is the Greek letter theta. We use this to represent angles. Okay. <clears throat> you don't have to, but it's a common practice to use theta for angles. Now, what about the other three? Remember there were six of them. Well, it turns out that these are not actually new. They're actually all functions of the ones in the left. So in other words, let's see how those are defined. Um, the cotangent equals one over the tangent, which implies that it's adjacent over opposite. The secant, is the inverse of the cosine, which means that it is H over A. And then finally, the cosecant, whoops, must therefore be the inverse of the sine. Actually, we, the parentheses are not absolutely necessary. You can write sine theta or sine with parentheses. And that implies that it is H over O. So they're really not three unique um, measures. They're just inverses of the existing ones. Oh, that's right. Remember all this good stuff? Is it coming back? Now, if you wanna look at um, some of these in symbol lab, these have very strange behavior though. These are cyclical functions they're called, and you'll see why in a second. Let's take a look, for example, at the cosine of X or theta, whatever. I think this thing has Greek letters, but I'll just ask for X. Oh. Now that's something you don't see every day. Look at that. It comes and goes through cycles. 
up and down and up and down and up and down and it never stops repeating. So this is one of the key properties of these trig functions is that they have this repeating pattern to them. And so they're useful in many different disciplines like engineering, for example, but there in many other areas, we don't see them at all. Very specialized set of uh, functions. And this is what really makes them unique is the way they keep repeating themselves over and over and over again. Okay. Um, if you want to look at now, little, still, uh, it's undefined. Yeah, you see, there's a bunch of vertical asymptotes here. So it's not defined for every value of X or theta. Um, let's do this. Let's take a look at the cotangent. <coughs> I'm interested in seeing this because I, <laughs> oh, all right. Well, it's, it's curving the other way, isn't it? Why, yes, it is. That's strange. Okay, so anyway. Angles. Now, here we're going to actually go back to the very beginning here. We're going to even define even interesting basic concepts of angles. Oh, okay. Um, all right, thanks for telling me. Yeah, it happens. You know, it, you know, any kind of thing can go wrong with technology. And any, in fact, I'm kind of surprised so far. This is my second session of the day, and so far, nothing's going wrong with Zoom. And I'm kind of startled to see that. Um, so let's just cross our fingers and keep, make sure it keeps going. Um, anyway, you might recall the distinction with, between a, a line and a ray is that a ray has a specific starting point. Um, a line, as you know, goes on forever between positive and negative infinity, but a ray has a specific starting point. So like, here's an example of two rays. They both have a common what we call a vertex. Um, so they start here. The arrows are meant to indicate that they go on forever. Okay. The theta represents the relationship between these two lines. So we're going to see in the next graph um, the actual notation listed there. And this will start to come back to you um, as we go along. But the key detail here is that we have to specify where did we start and where did we finish. In other words, it matters whether we're going from here to here or here to here. That will have a major influence on the value of theta. So we have an initial side, we have an terminal side, and the point where they meet is called the vertex. Okay, now we've seen that word vertex in another context. Here it means the common point where two rays start. So there's a, a notion of a direction. Which direction are we going? <clears throat> Okay, well, it's starting to look very scary, but um, very abstract. But, you know, we need to have this background. Before. The rest will not make any sense otherwise. Now, you might remember, I'm going to do a quick quiz on you. How many degrees are there in a circle? We just type in this in a new slide. Ooh, somebody has the answer. 360, that's right. So to go all the way around the circle is 360. And by the way, um, how many degrees are there in a triangle? Ooh, I've got you stumped. The three angles in the triangle have to add up to 180 degrees. Okay. Ah, uh, so this is coming back in stages, isn't it? Yes. 
Now, what's interesting here is that a degree is therefore defined as 103 60th of the entire rotation of a circle. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is that when we measure these angles, let me just quickly draw a picture here. So remember, a degree is therefore just simply 1 360th of the entire circle or rotation. We're thinking in terms of rotation. We're moving from a starting point to a finishing point or a terminal point. But what surprises us maybe is that when you can measure angles, you're actually going, let's say you're looking at the angle between these two points. We're moving in a counterclockwise direction. Oh, so you're thinking of going from in the counterclockwise direction. Going all the way around once means I've ha I have 360 degrees. Anything less than that is something smaller than that. 90 degrees takes us through one full quadrant. Okay, 90, 180, 270, and finally 360. <clears throat> So we want to be able to measure these angles. And once we have those angles, we want to be able to calculate these trig functions based on those angles. Okay. So um, let's see. All right. Uh, now we often assume that the starting point, the vertex is at the origin. This is what we mean by the standard position, okay? The vertex is at the origin, which is the point zero comma zero. And then we move in a counterclockwise direction to measure our angles. Okay, so in other words, what we just did here, it looks like we went 90 degrees through the first quadrant and halfway through the second quadrant, which would be 145. And that implies that this angle is 135. Okay, 135 means we went through the entire first quadrant and halfway into the second quadrant. Now, here's a very bizarre twist. What if we went in the opposite direction? Okay, this is the rule that we're going to follow. And we'll, we'll get back to this again on Thursday. But I just want to mention that if we go in a counterclockwise direction like this, the angle is positive. If we go the other way, it's considered to be negative. Ooh, now that's interesting. Negative. How can an angle be negative? Well, negative is defined as going in a clockwise direction. Okay. So um, here's an example. Um, if I go around the normal way, I'm going through two quadrants plus halfway into the third quadrant. So that angle should be 90 plus 90 plus 45, which is 225. But if I go the other way around, look what I'm doing. If I go this way, I'm going through the first quad, fourth quadrant plus halfway into the third quadrant. Oh, so the same, it's the same angle. 225 and negative 135 are the same angle. But they're going in different directions. So 225 means I'm going this way through two and a half quadrants, this direction, one and a half quadrants. So they actually mean the same thing. It's because all that matters is the terminal point. Okay, we don't care how you got there. From the starting point to the terminal point, whatever it took to get there, that's where we, that's the important detail, okay? 
Well, anyway, so you can see that it's been a while. So we'll we'll get back to this on Thursday. I think that's enough trig for now. So um, I'll be posting the solutions that we just went over. And then um, I'm pretty confident I'll be back by Thursday. Um, this should be over within a day or so. And then um, we'll carry on from there. And eventually we'll get problem sets for five. And eventually we'll have another midterm. But that's down the road. Let's not even think about that right now. Oh, I almost forgot. Today's Halloween. Wow, I hope you have some fun plans. I don't. I'm going to be here. I'm going to try to eat chicken soup or something. So, um, all right. So, I'll just see you all. And by the way, don't forget, uh, eventually I'll post the video as soon as it's ready onto uh, YouTube as well, in case you want to look at it again. Oh, we have a chat. Oh, yes. Thank you. Have a happy day and happy Halloween. Yes, you too. All right. So, and then bear too. <laughs> Goodbye, bear. Um, see you all next time. <laughs> Have a good day. All right. Bye. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Bye. Hi, Professor Anderson. Uh, I sent you an email. I was just wondering. Uh, oh, I didn't you mean about how you did on the on the test? Uh, it was a follow-up email to that. Oh, I didn't see that one. Okay. Oh, no. oh I'm, I'm about to send it. I'm sorry. I'm about to okay. send it. Oh, okay. Okay. Did Bye. I, was I supposed to get an email for my? Um, uh, no, I guess it'll have to wait till I see you in person. Okay. 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 Thank All you right. so much. See you next time. Okay. Bye. <laughs>